study on this book of 2 Corinthians. So uh, let's flick over to chapter 3, which is what we'll be looking at today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Before we get into that, uh, I'll do a bit of revision to remind us of the things that we've done over the past, I don't know, three or four months, I guess, something like that. So let's remember the things that we've covered in this book so far, in chapters 1 and 2, in the general context of the book of 2 Corinthians. So, the letter is, as I've mentioned before, somewhat challenging to follow at times, but the gist of it is usually that it is Paul's attempt to reconcile, reconcile with the Corinthian church as their relationship had become quite fragile. Recall that he references his first letter to the Corinthians, the letter we know as 1 Corinthians today, where he gave them many doctrines, many, um, many rebukes. Uh, he, they were doing many things wrong, and he had to go and address all the problems that the Corinthians were doing. And as a result of that letter, the, the relationship was um, hit, basically, with a sledgehammer. And then, of course, when he was in Ephesus, he, we know also, well, we, at least we infer that he did make a brief journey across to Ephesus uh, to try and uh, get things fixed again. And it was also a difficult uh, visit to him. So we can uh, read from chapter 2, verse uh, 1, to see what I'm talking about here, if we, just to remind ourselves. Uh, for 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. So it's again telling us that he has been to them in sorrow before. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom uh, I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote to you. It is 1 Corinthians. We, we infer it's 1 Corinthians, although some people think there's another letter there that we don't have. But uh, my opinion is it's just referring to 1 Corinthians. This is the very thing I wrote you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Again, referring to 1 Corinthians then. When he wrote that letter, he was writing that letter with much affliction and anguish of heart and many tears because of just the number of problems that he had to address with this congregation and the number, um, the um, personal attacks he was receiving that he had to address which he addresses again in this letter now. So that's um, the context of 2 Corinthians. It's a follow-up from 1 Corinthians. It's a follow-up from his uh, previous visit to uh, Corinth, where it was a very uh, sorrowful visit. Um, now, one of the main issues, of course, aside from all the doctrinal issues that he addresses in 1 Corinthians, is the fact that there were people in that church who were maligning Paul. They were making personal attacks on Paul, saying that he's not a real apostle, uh, saying that he is, um, you know, basically um, a bit of a loser, I guess you might say. He was, he, he doesn't deny it. He was homeless, he was beaten, he was kicked from one city to the next to the next. People hated him. Uh, he was poor, uh, he, he was uh, constantly shipwrecked many times. He, he was uh, maybe considered bad luck. So many people who were worldly minded in the Corinthian church were saying, look at this Paul guy, he's not a real apostle. Look at him, he's a, he's a vagabond, he's a vagrant. He's an embarrassment to our congregation. Um, and that's why he has to write these things in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So again, to revise, we're still in revision, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we see Paul hint at this, this issue, but although he covers it more fully in this, uh, the second letter now. But in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 1, he talks about these people who were um, attacking his name. And he says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? People were saying he's not an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. And he goes on. So he's making a defense here in this first letter. Um, and so we'll get into that in, in 2 Corinthians, especially towards the end of the letter where he makes his full, his full defense against those people who were attacking his apostleship and his, his person. Um, so as we get into chapter 3, there's a couple of things I want to re remind ourselves of, right? That this letter, as challenging as it can be to sort of follow Paul's line of thought, it has three 
or I've divided it at least into three sections. Chapters 1 to 7, which is what we're still looking at, is his general reconciliation with the Corinthians. Chapters 8 and 9, he's still reconciling, but he, de he deals with a fairly specific question of the collections for the saints. And then chapters 10, 11, 12 and 13, towards the end, he has a very strong rebuke of um, these false teachers who he calls the super apostles. He's being sarcastic and he's calling them, these people who are attacking his apostleship, he's calling these super apostles who are so well spoken, so wealthy and so powerful. They're the super apostles, but of course he's being sarcastic. Another thing I wanted to point out and remind ourselves is the general, a theme we see recurring throughout this letter is Paul's comparison between the physical and the spiritual, between the temporal and the eternal. And so that we're going to see today in this vein is the, um, the comparison between the old covenant and the new covenant, the mosaic covenant and Christ's covenant. So that's what we're going to look at today. Again, on that theme of the spiritual versus the eternal, uh, sorry, the spiritual versus the physical, um, worldly things versus spiritual things and so on. So um, chapter three, um, the beginning of that chapter is somewhat unfortunate. Often we've mentioned and we've just talked about how the chapter divisions are not very well placed, obviously added by men, not under the spirit, but through their own, um, the way they think best, how to put these chapter divisions in. Um, chapter three, verses one and, and uh, uh, two, I guess, probably better belong in the end of chapter two. Uh, but let's, let's uh, read, um, uh, in chapter 2, verse 17, reading just at the end there, we'll see what Paul is talking about. He says, for we, and he's talking about himself as an apostle here, uh, not, not we, broadly speaking, the Corinthians, but we, the apostles, uh, maybe the people who are with him, his, his, his immediate disciples or uh, helpers. For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Um, why is Paul talking about this at this point now? Um, we are not like many peddling the word of God. Peddling to you know to mean to be someone selling selling the word of God for a profit, teaching for a profit, that kind of thing. He's saying we're not like this, um, but that means that there were people like that in the Corinthian church. Otherwise, why would he bring it up? And so. He's now referring to these people. He starts talking about these people who are peddling the word of God. And it goes straight on in, in chapter 3, verse 1. He's still continuing that thought. And he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for us, written not in the, with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So those people who are peddling the word of God, the super apostles, they're saying, well, Paul, he's not only a homeless man and is poor and is beaten and kicked out of cities and things like that. He doesn't even have any letters of commendation from other churches like we do. We, the super apostles, we've got letters from who knows where, Ephesus or Jerusalem or Antioch. Paul doesn't have any letters of commendation, of recommendation to say, yeah, he's a good apostle, you can trust his word. He doesn't have that and he can't be trusted. Therefore, this Paul, his embarrassment already, we shouldn't really be listening to the things that he's saying to us. And that's why he's got this ongoing problem in the church when he goes there and visits there. And it's a sorrowful visit. I can, I can only imagine the types of arguments and bitterness that would have occurred with these people when Paul is trying to convince them to come back to the truth. Um, <clears throat> now, Paul, of course, thinks that this is just totally ridiculous. Um, he, got, he, he, he explains it for us in verse 2. He says, You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifest that you are a letter of Christ, cared for us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. <coughs> so, this isn't sort of meaningless, just um, feel-good nonsense that Paul is saying here. He's actually, you know, He's using metaphors, but he's also being quite literal that they are his letter 
uh, because he established that congregation. We can turn it, just read about it. Let's turn to Acts chapter 18. This is in Paul's second, or so-called second missionary journey. He's traveling through Greece. He's been to Athens where we, you know, he, he said, um, you know, the famous sermon on Mars Hill where they were worshiping an unknown God and all that happened and he teaches the people in Athens. And then after that, he goes to Corinth. And so in, in Acts 18 verse one, it says, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, being, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and uh, they were working because they were tent makers. There's a bit of context there. But it says in verse 4, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So there was no church at the time in this, city, in this city. There was a synagogue, and Paul was there trying to persuade them to believe in Christ. And, uh, and it goes on to say in verses 5 and 6 that you know, he got some support from Silas and Timothy. Um, but the Jews generally rejected him. And at the end of verse 6, after they rejected him for the last time, he says, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And, uh, but there were some who believed, as we read about in verse 7. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. So I assume he was a Jew being next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. So these are uh, probably more so Gentiles at this point, some Jews and some Gentiles. And in verse 9, And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So here we have Paul. He's spending a long time in Corinth. He establishes the church there, and he spends 18 months there teaching them and, is, and fully establishing that congregation. And so you can see when... When these super apostles, these false teachers, come along and say, well, where's Paul's letters of commendation? Paul's response is, well, it's just ridiculous. I established this church. You didn't exist before I came and taught you. To ask for a letter of commendation for me is just absurd. So anyone could see the effects of his teaching better than a letter of recommendation. They can see the, the physical effects that there is a church there, established, taught, they have problems, of course, they have many problems, but the church exists and that is his letter. And I think um, it's very silly for people to say, well, where's his letter of commendation from another con congregation, which he had probably established in the first place anyway. So that's a little brief start to the chapter three, which really continues from chapter two. But the bulk now of chapter three is dealing with this question of like I said at the start here, uh, the difference between the spiritual and the physical, and specifically now, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And we can probably see that Paul is sort of transitioning into this subject at the end of verse 3 there. So he's talking about the church being um, his letter, but he goes on to say it's not written on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And probably the first thing that we should think of when we read that is the Old Covenant, written on the tablets of stone, the, the Ten Commandments for, of the Mosaic Law. Paul is now transitioning into a new subject. And the rest of this verse then is going to be, sorry, the rest, rest of the chapter is, is really going to be quite a, uh, a doctrinal section. So far we've really, chapters one and two to a large extent have looked, dealt with Paul's personal circumstances and the, the circumstances of the Corinthian church. Paul's travels, uh, Paul's, um, you know, where he's, where he's been and gone, um, things like that. This is the first big section where we have a, a part on just basically soul doctrine, pure doctrine. And, and of course there's not, Paul's using this as an attack as well, right? You've got to remember that these super apostles, they have fleshly minds, they have minds set on the things on this earth. And so Paul, when he is writing this section now on the difference between the Mosaic law and, the, and Christ's law, he's teaching those people that their, their minds and their hearts are in the wrong place. They're still focusing on the Mosaic law. Then that, that's why Paul was writing this section right now. 
remind ourselves who these super apostles were, uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just to see, to remind ourselves why Paul is writing to these people about the Mosaic law. In, two, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, um, chapter 21, Well, firstly, let's read from verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 5. The New American says, For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles, although in the margin it does say super apostles. So the New American translators do recognize the sarcasm being employed by Paul here. And most other translations also use the phrase super apostles. So that's the people he's talking about in chapter 11. <coughs> But he goes on in verse 21. These, these would have been Jews, right? Judaizers, Judaizers, and Jews themselves. Well, Paul is going to say, well, in verse um, uh, 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. So Paul is saying that these super apostles, apostles who are maligning Paul and asking for these letters of commendation who are false teachers, Paul himself, if they think they're super apostles because of their Jewish background, so is Paul. In any way that they would think that they are superior to Paul, Paul is easily their equal. He, as we know elsewhere, he says he was a Pharisee among Pharisees before he was a before he was converted to Christ. He was taught by Gamaliel in one of the most prestigious schools. So for them to lord it over him that they are Israelites and they are Jews and they are children of Abraham, Paul's, Paul is saying, well, so am I. But Paul, he knows his genealogy. He knows his background. But he, not being worldly minded, recognises that this is not of any importance any longer. Let's turn back to um, chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. Those who are worldly minded, like these super apostles, are going to lord over everybody else, their genealogies, their histories, their family names and so on. Paul doesn't do any of this, despite the fact that he has every right to, he doesn't do it. And that's what the rest of this chapter is all about. So reading from verse 4. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. So those who think that their adequacy comes from their lineage or their genealogy are mistaken. Paul is saying he, as an apostle, his adequacy does not come from the fact that he is a Hebrew among Hebrews. It comes from God. Verse 6, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was. And we'll turn and read that in just a moment, what that's all about. How will this ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of commendation, sorry, condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, how much more that, that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lays over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the sa into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. We're going to go through those passages now in a bit more detail. Verse 6 says that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Is there talking about the Old Covenant? <coughs> The old covenant kills, but the spirit, the new covenant, gives life. This is 
perhaps for some a difficult saying, but we need to understand what Paul is saying here. There's probably a few passages that we can turn to for a bit of context on this. Firstly, let's look at Galatians chapter 3. Paul here, talking to the Galatian church, um, gives a bit of a, uh, gives some teaching on the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. This congregation had the same problem. Uh, they were still clinging to the old ways of the Old Covenant, like the Corinthians, or at least some in the Corinthians were doing. So in, in Galatians 3, um, verse 22, he's talking about the Old Law. And he says, but the scripture, that is, he's talking about the old law, the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Paul here is using the metaphor that the law, the old law is a custodian. It shuts you up, it, it constrains you, and it's a tutor. It's in fact, it imprisons you is what he says. That's one way of looking at the old law. And then we could also turn to Romans uh, chapter 7 uh, to read another way of looking at the old law. Romans 7 verse 9. Paul talking about his spiritual journey. As we all know, we are born children, perfect in the eyes of God, without sin. There is no inherited sin. There is no original sin. We are sinless when we are born. But what does Paul say in verse 9? I was once alive apart from the law. He was spiritually alive. He wasn't spiritually dead as Adam and Eve became when they sinned. He was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So here we have, that's a sermon right there that you could, well, I think I have done a sermon on that some time ago, but uh, on the meaning of what Paul is saying here, that he was once alive apart from the law, but at some point in his life, the law came to him and he died. Now there, we can, I'm not going to go through it now, but that's when Paul had the consciousness developed sufficiently to understand the law. Sin requires the mental action of understanding that there is a law, that there is sin, that there is a choice. And you choose the sin over the law. That's when sin becomes alive and you die spiritually. So Paul's description of the law here is something that brings about death because without the law, there cannot be spiritual death. If God doesn't give us a law, then there is no law that we can break. But God did give the Jews a law and through it, they sinned and they died. So in that sense, the law brings about death. So he's saying the same thing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's, let's turn back to our text. The law as a custodian, as an imprisoner, as something that brings about death. It divides between sin and righteousness, and mankind always chooses sin, most of the time at least, at some point in their lives. Um, these Judaizers in the, the Corinthian church didn't realize the limitations of the Old Covenant. They were focused on these things that were written on stone, the Mosaic Law, and they had forgotten that that can't bring about salvation or, or, or forgiveness of sins. They were so focused on these superficial appearances, just like the superficiality of how they viewed Paul. Now, Paul now gets into this subject a bit more deeply on, on this new covenant that we have. The old covenant kills. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But he goes on to say, but if the ministry of death, this is in verse 7, if the ministry of death, the old covenant, in letters engraved on stone, came with glory, 
so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? This old covenant came with glory. How much more does the new covenant come with glory? Let's, for those who might not be familiar with this passage, let's go turn to Exodus chapter 34 to read about what Paul is talking about. What is Paul talking about when he says that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face? Exodus 34. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, being given the Ten Commandments for the second time after destroying them for the first time, he came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone. And this is what it says about it in verse 29, Exodus 34, verse 29. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand and as he was coming down the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of those speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And uh, skipping down to verse 33, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went to speak with him. That's what Paul is talking about here, this incident that occurred at Mount Sinai, that every time, when, when, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and when he spoke with God, his face shone because of the glory of God that was reflected in his face. And it was so bright that the sons of Israel couldn't even look at his face. So he had to put a veil over his face to cover that glory so that they could communicate with him, basically. That's how, the, that's how much glory was contained in the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. So much glory that they couldn't even look at it. That's the metaphor that we're looking at here, right? That Moses' face representing that covenant was very glorious, extremely glorious, notwithstanding that it brought about death, that it brought about, that it kills, that it was a custodian and a tutor. It was still extremely glory, and Paul never denies that. But he goes on to say, how much more glory is in this new covenant in Christ? And that's what, that's what he says in um, verse uh, 9 and 10. Um, how much, if the ministry of condemnation has glory, how much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. So he's basically saying, look, the new covenant is so glorious that even the old one, basically, it looks like nothing in comparison. And then in verse 12, he starts with the word, therefore. Therefore, having such hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses. So Paul is now drawing a comparison the new spiritual covenant is not supposed to be hidden by a veil. The old one was. Moses hid his face, hid the glory of the old covenant because it was too bright to be comprehended. But Paul is saying this new covenant is not supposed to be this way. Therefore, we having, having such hope, we use great boldness in our speech. He's talking about the apostles here. The apostles were instructed to preach this gospel with great boldness, without any restrictions. And we should be thinking about perhaps what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 14. A city set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before all men. So, that instruction from Jesus himself was that this great light of the new covenant, infinitely brighter than the old covenant, which had to be veiled, was to be preached without restriction and shone upon all men. And we see this again in Acts 4. Jesus, Jesus commanded it in Matthew 5. In Acts 4, we see it put into practice. In Acts 4 verse 19, when Peter and John are preaching in Jerusalem and they are told 
to shut their mouths, basically by the Pharisees, or the Sadducees, I think it might have been. Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So the response of the apostles in that instance is, we are not going to suppress the truth here. We are going to preach, preach it loudly and without restriction because we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So Jesus' Jesus's commandment was put into practice by these apostles. And Paul um, is the same. So in verse 13, Paul touches upon the veil again. We just read about it in, in Exodus 34. Uh, it says, Therefore we have such hope, we use great boldness in our speech, and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. So, as I mentioned before, <coughs> Paul is using this as a metaphor, right? The, the veil of Moses, and Moses' face is a metaphor for the deficiencies of the Old Covenant, which brought about death. The New Testament, in comparison, is not covered and is not hidden, and that's why it's proclaimed with boldness of speech. But at the end of that, pass at that verse there, it says, and not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Uh, we should probably pause there for a moment and look, look intently at that passage it should not so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away what was fading away Moses' face was fading away it was brilliant and glorious of course but eventually it faded away it went back to normal again Moses is applying this glory of Moses' face and the fact that it was fading and he's using that to say, this is the old covenant. Glorious and wondrous as it was, it is fading away. And it is scheduled. It is supposed to fade away. But what was prophesied to come after the old covenant? Put yourself in the Jews' shoes um, 1,000, 1,500 years before Christ, receiving these laws. And... This, this fading away of Moses' face, if they read their own scriptures, what, what would have meant to them? It was to tell, to tell them that the old covenant was supposed to fade away and something better was to come after it. The new covenant was not something that just happened of its own. It was always prophesied to come about. But the Israelites, they couldn't understand this fact, could they? They, as we know, they were fleshly minded throughout much of their time. They, they made the golden calf while Moses was on the mountain and they continued in their ways of idolatry for most of their existence. So when it says they could not look intently at the end of what was fading away, the end of what was fading away was actually a good thing because the end of what was fading away was the start of the new covenant in Christ. But they could not look at this. They were not spiritually prepared or mature. And aside from that, it wasn't even revealed to them in the first place. They had some hints in their scriptures about the things to come, about the Messiah who would save mankind from their sins. But it was not revealed to them, everything that was going to happen. And the classic passage that we can read that explains this to us is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's turn there now, 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 is looking backwards to, to these old fathers, these old prophets from a long ago, who were trying to understand the things that God was telling them. And in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 it says, As to this salvation, the salvation of Christ, right? that's what Peter is talking about, the prophets who prophesied of this grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. 
so there we have it that these prophets at least those uh, and, and the, those who were righteous in those in the kingdoms kingdoms of um, Israel and Judah some of them were studying the scriptures carefully to see what what was God talking about these strange passages hinting at something to come after the old covenant that a new covenant would be made that a new covenant would come but they could not understand it because it wasn't revealed to them they were making careful searches and inquiries but it wasn't revealed to them that these the, the full extent of what was to come and so I think in 2nd Corinthians um, chapter 3 where it does say that they could not look intently at the end uh, at the end of what was fading away they couldn't look at the the end of what was fading away was the next thing that was the new covenant and they could not look intently at it they could study the scriptures and maybe get a hint of what was to come but they could not study it intently not that they were spiritually minded to anyway for the most part even if it had been revealed to them I think that's an important thing to note here what Paul was saying about these um, Israelites who were fleshly minded that the old covenant to them was was everything that was the be-all and end-all and the same people today well in his day at least the Corinthian church they had the same mindset as those back then who's who were unable to look to what was coming they could not look for the new covenant and so reading on in verse 14 those Jews who rejected Christ were in the same position as those ancient Israelites who could not look upon the face of Moses in verse 14 it says but their minds were hardened for until this very day at the readings of the old covenant the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ <coughs> but to, the, to this day whenever Moses is read a veil lies over their heart but whoever sorry whenever a person turns to the Lord the veil is taken away so the glory of the old covenant at the time Paul wrote this letter the glory of the old covenant had completely faded uh, it was gone and these Jews were still living under that veil it had not been lifted in Christ but verse 18 says but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit now I think I think that Paul is, he says we all before when he says we he's talking about we the Apostles now he's talking about all Christians we all with unveiled face so all Christians who have seen Christ and obey Christ this vow has been lifted and we behold the glory of the Lord but something important to note is that the old Israelites they they beheld God as through a veil we don't behold God as through a veil we behold it as in a mirror and I think we should take note of that that we are still not looking at God directly even under the new covenant we are beholding him as through a mirror so there is glory yet to come still and I think that's what it says at the end of verse 18 we are being transformed into the same image from glory the glory of God through a mirror into glory which will be the full glory of God that happens at the end of this age this glory is accessible to us now in Christ through baptism by, and by serving him faithfully until the end of our days and that glory that is yet to come when we will no longer behold the glory of God in a mirror but fully face to face that's the end of chapter 3 thank you